Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Humanities Centre. It really is a, a great pleasure to see you all here as we start this new and uh, extended exploration of what we've called natural landscapes and human meaning. This is not the first time that we have uh, undertaken such extensive work. Uh, a few years ago, some of you here may remember, we devoted three semesters of our programming to the topics of beauty, goodness, and truth, namely those ideas that informed uh, the foundation of our university back in the 1940s. Now, this new undertaking is even more ambitious. It stretches across six semesters and consists not simply of panel series, but of exhibitions, such as this one, uh, special lectures and classes for our students. Now we'll be focusing on the connections between the human imagination and the diverse array of environments in our world, deserts, mountains, forests, ice, cities, and the topic of this semester, the ocean. I want here to acknowledge the multidisciplinary team of faculty that worked together to develop this multi-year program. Uh, Derek Cartwright uh, at the back of the Department of Art, Architecture and Art History, uh, Ron Kaufman and Beth O'Shea, who is, um, is Beth here? Oh, well, well, I'm saying thank, thank you, Beth. Um, both from uh, the Department of Environmental and Ocean Sciences and uh, Noel Norton, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, as ever, I also want to thank Lindy Deer, uh, the Assistant Director of the Humanities Centre for her erstwhile work in helping us stage and deliver our programming. And also all those faculty members, some of whom are here, there's 18 of them in total, who will be contributing to this series of discussions. Now, one of the uh, inspirations lying behind this endeavour was the pioneering and visionary work of oh, this is not working. Make yourselves comfortable. This is uh, this can take some time. Uh, okay, this one. There's something sort of gone wrong. There we go. There we go. We're going to have to do this manually, but never mind. Um, so as I say, one of the inspirations lying behind this endeavour was the pioneering and visionary work of the geographer uh, Yifu Tuan, principally in his book, uh, Romantic Geography in Search of the Sublime Landscape. Uh, Professor Tuan's life was spent broadening and deepening the field of geography, exploring its moral, poetic, aesthetic, and philosophical implications, and emphasizing how human beings are drawn to certain striking landscapes. Uh, Professor Tuan died earlier this year at the age of 91, but he would have been an, an advisor to our series had he lived. I want to acknowledge here the encouragement he gave to us when we started out on this project. Now, with each of the distinct environmental landscapes we'll consider, the aim will be to approach them from a multitude of perspectives. We'll be thinking about each terrain from the perspective of science, and the effect of each terrain upon the varied productions of the human imagination. As you know, we are starting this series with the great theme of the ocean. And I'll say a few words about that theme. And then my dear colleague and friend, Ron Kaufman, will orient us further by talking about the science of the ocean. Um, after that, please do stay around and join us for the, the reception, which should be appearing any moment now. And I would also encourage you to view our current related exhibition, uh, Some Bodies, Oceanic Imagination in Contemporary Art, which has been beautifully curated by Derek Cartwright. Thank you, Derek. Subsequent Tuesday sessions in this series, starting next week, will deal with such matters as ocean exploration, the folklore of the sea, uh, the appeal of the ocean for those working in scientific and artistic fields and so on. You'll see full details of that on the flyer for the series. And if you if you want to pick one of these up, then I will leave them on the table over here. Uh, 
the boundless uh, ocean exhibits all of those features that inspired this series. It is something that seems always to have fascinated human beings with whom it has an uneasy relationship, equally alluring and terrifying. Uh, very few of us living where we do will be unaware of the sense of calm that the sight of the ocean can bring to us. How many of us have not gone to the shore during times of stress and difficulty and loss in order maybe to be consoled and comforted by that great expanse of water lying between us and the horizon. Uh, Emerson, in his great celebrated essay on nature, emphasized the medicinal quality of an expansive view, such as that provided by the line of the ocean. He says this, it's up here. To the body and mind which have been cramped by noxious work or company, nature is medicinal and restores their tone. The tradesman, the attorney, comes out of the din and craft of the street and sees the sky and the woods, and we might add, of course, the sea, and is a man again. In their eternal calm, he finds himself. The health of the eye seems to demand a horizon. We are never tired so long as we can see far enough. It's a lovely line here, never tired so long as we can see far enough. And this, of course, evokes and very powerfully one aspect of the ocean's effect on our minds. It's calming, almost narcotic effect. But in addition to this, uh, the ocean has a markedly different quality, that of unnerving, even terrifying us. Uh, this can be experienced when we think of the unfathomable depths of water and of the strange life forms in that water that could swallow us up, snuffing out our little lives, along with all our hopes and aspirations. And that aspect of things confronts us also when we think, for example, of a raging storm at sea. It's a staple of the novel, of course, from Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe onwards, and of maritime paintings. Here's one example I particularly like. This is Edward Moran's The Sea from 1870. Uh, one can almost feel the motion of the waves here, and we fear for the fate of the ship that will be engulfed soon by the storm to be unleashed by those lowering clouds. And it's this aspect of the ocean, its frightening power, its reputation as a place of disaster that lies uh, within one of my favorite British idioms, which is uh, the saying, worse things happen at sea. My mother would always say this to me when I was terrified of something at school. Worse things happen at sea. Because this means that things could be worse than they are and that one should take some kind of comfort in that. It's a peculiarly British thing to say to people to make them, you could be drowning, so you should be happy. <laughs> if we want a more literary description of the ocean's destructive quality, we can turn to Joseph Conrad, uh, one of the greatest of sea writers. This is a gorgeous picture of Joseph Conrad here very gouty individual. Uh, you can see his hands wrapped up here. Always smoking, which you never see anymore. So this is a very antique image. And Conrad offers to us these words in his gorgeous and evocative book, The Mirror of the Sea, that I would heartily recommend to everyone. This is a lovely passage. The sea, this truth must be confessed, has no generosity. The ocean has the conscienceless temper of a savage autocrat spoiled by much adulation. He cannot brook the slightest appearance of defiance and has remained the irreconcilable enemy of ships and men ever since ships and men had the unheard of audacity to go afloat together in the face of his frown. From that day, he has gone on swallowing up fleets and men without his resentment being glutted by the number of victims, by so many wrecked ships and wrecked lives. Today, as ever, he is ready to beguile and betray, to smash and to drown the incorrigible optimism of men who 
back by the fidelity of ships, are trying to wrest from him the fortune of their house, the dominion of their world, or only a dole of food for their hunger. If not always in the hot mood to smash, he is always stealthily ready for a drowning. The most amazing wonder of the deep is its unfathomable cruelty. Gorgeous use of the word unfathomable, the unfathomable there. And there's literal and metaphorical meanings here. Master of the English language. He didn't speak a word of English until he was 21 years old. Right, quite extraordinary. Anyway, this is rather interesting. I can experience the ocean in two markedly different ways. As something that inspires a sense of peace and serenity, and as something that provokes feelings of fear and danger. Another and famous way of stating this distinction is to say that the ocean is capable of being experienced at times as something beautiful and at other times as something sublime. Now, a word about this is in order, since the concept of the sublime will accompany us throughout the three years of this landscape series. And for thinking about landscape, the clearest and most evocative treatment of this subject is to be found, of course, in Edmund Burke's classic text from 1757, A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful. Burke's text operates on a clear and crisp distinction between things that are beautiful and things that are sublime. Or to put it another way, things that evoke in us a feeling of the beautiful and things that evoke a feeling of the sublime, on the other hand. We are attracted, he says, to both the beautiful and the sublime, but in markedly different ways. Things that are beautiful, Burke says, possess qualities which produce something like love or passion in us. And these qualities include things like smoothness, gradual variation, delicacy, fair and mild colors, the quality of being polished, and the result of which is the production in us of a sense of calmness and relaxation. Now, it is true that we can experience the ocean in this way. For example, uh, walking along the beach at Coronado at sunset on a calm evening with the waves gently and warmly lapping against our bare feet in a rhythmic fashion, our eyes drawn to the polished and mirror-like surface of the water, or having the sound of waves playing on one of those sleep aid devices favored by insomniacs, such as myself. And the physical sensation such experiences produce in us, or at least in some of us, is emblematic of Burke's idea as to how our bodies respond to the presence of beauty. He says, the whole body in the presence of beauty is composed and accompanied by an inward sense of melting and languor that we become that is relaxed and our attentions dissolve in the presence of beauty now fine though this is and very good in fact it's probably more appropriate for the ocean to be thought of in terms of the sublime sublime objects according to burke are characterized in terms of qualities opposite to those found in beautiful objects they are namely vast rugged powerful dark and obscure and produce in us astonishment and terror. Famously, he says, the passion caused by the great and sublime in nature, when those causes operate most powerfully is astonishment. And astonishment is that state of the soul in which all its motions are suspended with some degree of horror. This sense of horror produced often by the great powers of nature is exemplified, Burke thinks, precisely in our experience of the ocean. He says, a level plain of a vast extent on land is certainly no mean idea. The prospect of such a plain may be as extensive as a prospect of the ocean. But can it ever fill the mind with anything so great as the ocean itself? This is owing to several causes, but it is owing to none more than this, 
that this ocean is an object of no small terror. Now, we don't need to go into this bit in any enormous detail, but Burke wants to stress that in order for something terrifying to become sublime, some degree of distance from the object is necessary. Uh, for example, being on an imperiled ship in the eye of a storm is a terrifying experience, though not a sublime one. But if that experience of terror is translated into a powerful poem or a piece of prose, it can produce what the great Joseph Addison memorably called an agreeable kind of horror, an agreeable kind of horror. This is a very interesting thought about how we can get pleasure from things that are terrifying. And hence here, I suppose, the appeal of that entire genre of maritime painting, such as those by the Russian painter Ivan Ivazovsky, which depict ships in distress. There's some examples of this here. And this is really important because I don't really want to be on this ship uh, in this storm. But looking at this painting, gives me a kind of horrified delight. Um, you can look at this frequently. I do look at it frequently. It's hanging in my kitchen at home, not the original, but a, a reproduction of it. So it gives me a delight to see this. So the idea of actually being on this ship would be the most extraordinarily terrifying of experiences. And that's the distance factor that Burke is talking about, or one aspect of the distance factor. Now, there's another aspect of this to reflect upon, and this concerns that strange and distinctive place where human beings most commonly encounter the ocean, and that is the shoreline. Now, this is the subject of a fascinating first chapter in Richard Hamblin's recent book, The Sea, which is a really great book. For the chapter's epigram, Hamblin employs these lovely words by Jonathan Rayban in his book from the 80s, The Coasting. Very good book. Uh, the sea marks the end of things. It is where life stops and the unknown begins. But that seems rather misplaced given the teeming life in the ocean. We can't really say that life stops there. But we might say that the shoreline marks the division between the rigid orderliness of human social life and the chaos of the ocean. You can feel this, I think, most dramatically in those cities where busy streets and high-rise buildings nestle right up to the beaches. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking here of Waikiki Beach in Honolulu, which is a very, really remarkable variety of very modern high-rise buildings, and then immediately the ocean there. There are many others, of course. Now, it's here at the shoreline that the repressions of civilized life are noticeably softened. You should think about this. Fewer clothes are worn at the beach. And as Hamlin said, I quote, inhibitions can be cast aside with the clothes. Now this led to the perception, not altogether unfounded, that the seaside resort is a concept developed in the 18th century, of going to the sea for a vacation. This was a place of loose morals, a fear that it was a, a place of loose morals. And anxieties were expressed connected with longer established forms of disquiet over the morality of ports and the sexual license enjoyed at sea. So bodily suggestive music hall songs, such as this one titled, you can do a lot of things at the seaside, and then in parentheses, that you can't do in town. And you, you can fill in the gaps there. And this hinted at all of this. And a 19th century caricature, such as Thomas Rowlandson, could depict the lasciviousness that drew men to the seaside in the hopes of seeing the frolics of the scantily clad. Now, he does this here in, in a work, uh, Summer Amusement at Margate. Margate's a sort of archetypal English seaside town, now a, a haven for sort of top artists in, in Britain. Or, of course, a peep at the mermaids. So here have these very fully clothed men peeping at the naked bodies frolicking in the waves. Now, if 
If personal unveiling is one mark of the shoreline's liminality, then Hamlin draws our attention to another, the borderland between lawfulness and lawlessness in the activity of beachcombing, the activity in which people search or comb for things of value along the seashore. Now, often this consists purely of looking for seashells or uh, attractive driftwood, but sometimes it's involved collecting washed up cargo, the flotsam and jetsam lost or discarded from sunk or sinking ships. Now, such an activity, nicely known as aggravated beachcombing, the greatest, greatest terms, aggravated beachcombing, as a complex relation to legality, partly due, Hamlin writes, to a perception that the shoreline itself is public property, or rather that it belongs to no one in particular, and so anything found there is fair game. Again, you've got the idea that there's this bit, which is sort of away from the laws of, of civilized landlocked life. Now, I don't want to pursue those issues any further here, but just note one element of it. The washed up cargo will typically have come from vessels that found themselves in peril on the sea, and it's accordingly another sign of the danger of the ocean. Now, it is to avert some such dangers, namely of the coastal shipwreck, that that most iconic symbol of the human relationship to the ocean was created, namely the lighthouse. Mm -hmm.